turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8 and go to verse 22. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. We'll be praying for Sister Dina Fisher. She's been such a faithful woman of God, and I know that she wants to be in this service today. Amen. The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, And he cometh to to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes you know Jesus does some different things doesn't he amen He spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, this is so very important, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Close our Bibles and bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so very much for your word. Lord, help it to show us through your word our way, our path, our direction. We ask for this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Perspective is everything, isn't it? Some people see the glass half full, other people see the glass half empty. Some people are happy that they have a job and some people wish they had another job. Perspective is, a lot has a lot to do with the person doing the prospecting or the thinking or using their faculties for, shall we say, interpreting life. Perspective means a lot to the individual who is using their mind to understand their surroundings. Amen? This portion of Scripture is extremely unique. If you ever want a great roller coaster ride, go through Mark chapter 8. It is incredibly filled with with so much fruit. It's a wonderful passage. It's a wonderful portion of Scripture in the Word of God. There is unique to this particular passage is there's never been a partial healing ever recorded in the Word of God outside in Jesus' ministry. But this particular blind man. You see, perspective is everything. The context of this particular healing is extremely different than blind Bartimaeus. And when you begin to look at in the scriptures healing, how many times they occur, it it occurs a lot. Jesus had a desire to see people who could not see have sight. Healing of the blind is one of the most recorded miracles that Jesus was constantly doing. He wanted people to see. He loved it when people would 
ask for him to touch them. And then when he would touch them, their eyes would open and they would see things that they could never see before. Now, blind Bartimaeus, when he got healed, it was different than this guy. Blind Bartimaeus was smart. He was boisterous. He was not like this guy. And God has a way. It doesn't matter what your personality is like. It doesn't matter who you are. He knows how to touch you. Blind Bartimaeus is when Jesus went by. He said, oh, thou son of David. He was appealing to Jesus' earthly Ascent to the throne. And by faith, he was calling out his healing. In fact, Jesus didn't even stop by to give him recognition the first time. Jesus, thou son of David. He was an obnoxious kind of guy, the kind of guy that if Jesus was in the vicinity and he had the opportunity, he was not going to allow Jesus to get by without giving him his healing. Amen. There's some people that they just come to church and they just want to go through the motions. There's other people when they come to the house of God, they're here because they mean business. They want to get a hold of almighty God. They're not just showing up. They are here to touch the throne of God. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Bain Bartimaeus was extremely serious, but here we have a very passive man. And it doesn't even give reference that he was requesting healing. What the Bible does tell us is that his friends brought him to Jesus. There's some very significant things about this particular city called Bethesda. Bethesda is where this blind man lived extremely close to. And the Bible tells us that his friends brought him. I'm thankful any time a friend brings somebody to the house of God. Amen? It's an awesome thing. And his friends bring this blind man to Jesus and he, and he tells Jesus, can you heal this man for us? There is a desire in his friends that they, their friend who is devastated, who cannot see, who is blind, that he would receive his sight and he is in completely new uncharted territory. And there is a reason that Jesus is taking this man now by the hand and he takes him outside of the city. There's a reason that Jesus does this. You see, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 22 to verse 26, Jesus had pronounced a curse over Bethesda. And he said to the, the people that live in that region, because of your unbelief, you will not see the things of God. So Jesus had already pronounced a judgment. That man being from that region, he had to take the man outside that particular region in order for him to touch him. The other thing that Jesus had to do was he also now had to relinquish control from his friends. You see, his friends had a tremendous amount of influence over him. They knew him as a blind man. That's all they had ever seen or known of him. But in order for someone to be seen and to be acknowledged in a different place and a different time, in order for somebody to receive sight, it has to be done by the person who can see beyond what they have ever seen before. And his friends could not get him there. So now Jesus takes his hand. And his friends watch as this blind man walks away with Jesus. One of the other things that we have to understand about this particular passage of Scripture is he's not the only one on the journey. He's not the only one from Bethesda. Andrew, Philip, and Peter were from Bethesda also. This is not just a blind man's journey. This is a journey of four men who have to learn how not to rely on family and friends and other things. 
They are strictly on a journey alone now with Jesus Christ and Him alone. Many of us, we want to try to get to the next level in our relationship with God. There's going to be at times that you cannot bring everyone with you. Your mom's not going to understand. Your dad may not understand. Your friends in high school may not understand. Your friends in college that you used to be lifelong buddies with, they may not understand because your perceptive begins to slowly change as you begin to walk with this man called Jesus. And I'm going to title this quick, very simply today, Do You Want to Be Healed? as he now begins his journey out of Bethesda, and he is now breaking away from his, compa- his companions, you have to understand what's now happening to this blind man. When you lack perception, you need the familiar. Let me say this again. When you lack... Why don't you say it with me? When you lack perception... You need the familiar. What begins to happen here is this blind man, he knows the sounds of his friends, and he understands and knows the hustle and the bustle of the city. He does not understand where he's headed. He knows the smells of Bethesda. He understands exactly how the city works in Bethesda. He knows the bells of the synagogue. He understands all these things because he's used to it. He knows how to get around in Bethesda because he is familiar with that place. But when you lack perception and now all of a sudden Jesus is taking you to a place that you've never been before, that you don't know that it takes 14 steps to get to the bathroom and it takes 13 steps to get to the counter and it takes 18 steps to turn a right in the bedroom and then I can get to the faucet. When you're taken out of your comfort zone and you don't understand what's going on, all of a sudden it blows your perspective because you're no longer in the familiar and when you're not in the familiar you need a perspective that's going to get you to where Jesus is taking you and we get our perspective from the word of God let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise amen amen so here he is and he is on this journey with Jesus and he is his mind is getting blown You see, when you are losing your familiar surroundings, perspective is so different. Because now he is walking with a man that he doesn't know. He doesn't know the scent of Jesus. He doesn't know the smell of Jesus. He doesn't know the voice of Jesus. He doesn't know the clothing that Jesus wears. He doesn't know the cadence that Jesus walks in. But Jesus is taking him by the hand. And you go through the Bible, there are very few people that Jesus leads with him. But this man who has no familiar surroundings has to become very closely joined to Jesus Christ. You see, because when you lack perspective, you don't know what's coming around the corner. And the problem with the blind man is because he cannot see. He has to rely on the perception of the one who's directing him, who's guiding him, and who's taking him in a place that he has never, ever been before. The problem is when you're blind, your mind can play tricks with you. You see, when you're going on a road that you've never traveled before and you you hit a pothole and you can't see beyond that pothole, all of a sudden your body gyrates because you're in unbalanced area and before you take your next step, you don't know if you're going into a deeper hole. And so instead of trying to navigate that on your own, you have to then tense up and you begin to even grasp the one who's leading you even more. Have you ever taken somebody who's blind across the road? That's right. There's a couple of things that happen. If it's a If it's not a busy intersection and they're familiar with the area, out of respect and kindness, they will 
put their hands on your shoulder and they will allow you to take them from point A to point B. But if it's unfamiliar, they grab your arm and they try to walk step in step with you. And they do something to calm themselves. You'll notice that they talk to you a lot. There's a couple reasons that they do that. They want to make sure that you're comfortable because of the closeness that they have to now get to you. And they want to make sure that as you are leading them and guiding them, that you're comfortable. And if they know they can get you comfortable, they'll be comfortable too. See, the problem with perception, when we don't have it, it turns our world upside down. And we don't understand what Jesus is getting at. I want to go back to friends and see and, and kind of go through how friends hurt our perspective. People love us, don't they? You got friends, you got family, amen? Don't they love you? Don't they have wonderful intentions, amen? Remember when you were coming to a Pentecostal church your first time and you had to give up this and give up that, and all of a sudden your family, they saw the change that was happening inside your life, and they had so many questions. It wasn't that they didn't love you, they loved you, but they couldn't understand what was happening in your life. And just out of a love and a compassion, they didn't understand who was actually leading you and directing your life and guiding you along the road of life. They didn't understand that you were charting your course, you were leaving a perspective behind, and you were taking on to now a kingdom perspective. And those are different than what they know. They don't know how to navigate inside that world at all. And they have questions. You're going through marital problems. They say things like, sweetheart, you need to lose that individual. You need to get out of that relationship. You need to do this. You need to do that. Because they're tearing you down. See, but there's another perspective that God has. God says that the unbelieving spouse will dwell, that they will sanctify the unbelieving spouse that is not a perspective based out of happiness. It is a perspective based out of eternity. Two completely mind-blowing perspectives. Jesus has one. The world has another. In the Beatitudes, you have to understand perspective because there's some people who will witness and they'll share the gospel. And people will not receive the gospel when they share their perspective. But it doesn't bother them the way it bothers other people. Because they understand that they are blessed for doing so. And they come out with a praise and they have a joy about them. That even though they were rejected, they had an opportunity to lift up the King of Kings. And even if they were persecuted because of their belief, because of their divine perspective, there is a joy, there is a shout, and there is a worship that they have that other people will not or cannot understand. But when you are understanding that you're not walking in this world and you're walking in His his world, you have a completely different perspective. That's the kingdom of God. And that's a tough thing because there's a lot of people who love us, they care about us, they want to help us as best they can, but the carnal mind tells us that it is enmity against the things of God. You want right perspective? Get inside the book. You want clear perspective? Let the Holy Ghost get a hold of your life and speak the Word into your heart. And whether or not you can understand it or whether or not you can see past the corner, get as close to Jesus Christ as you can and never let go. Amen. So now here he is. He's taking these guys outside of the city. He's got this blind guy with him who is probably so petrified out of his mind. He's got Andrew, he's got Philip, and he has Peter. And they're leaving their hometown. They're leaving all their family behind. And they're now moving into this outskirt place that only Jesus and His disciples and this blind guy is getting to. The blind guy. All he has right now 
is Jesus Christ. And he leaves a city that has judgment cast on it. And Jesus won't do the miracles anywhere close to that place. You know why? It bothers him when he's walking with people who are always trying to get back to where they once were. You know, you think because you're heading through a trial, you think because, listen, you have no clue where he's taking you to. And if you are so blinded by your last vision of where you thought he was taking you and you want to go back to your last place where you had a good time with God and you want to go back to the way things used to be, stop it. God is taking you with him to a new level and the only way to get to a new level is you have to leave some things behind and you have to get onto the master's hand. You have got to get a new perspective. Old things have to pass away. Amen. And so we're walking with Jesus. He's taking his people with him. And then Jesus does something. Now, remember who he's got. He's got residents of Bethesda with him. He's got this blind guy with him. And he is leading them all out of the city. And he asked this man. He said, can you see? Jesus already knew if he could see before he asked him. But he wants the man to answer back to him and explain what he does see. He doesn't see everything very clearly. You see, the Bible tells us that we won't see ourselves as who and what we are. But until we get redeemed, until we get to heaven, then we'll see everything as clearly as we need to see everything. And he asked this guy, well, what exactly do you see? And there's a partial healing that's actually taking place in that man. Is he better? He's better. He's better than what he once was. He had no sight. He had no perception. Now he's actually beginning to know that there's something happening with his sight that he had never known or seen before. He doesn't have the full truth. He doesn't know what everything is going to be about. All he knows is that God has given him some ability to see. I wonder if he was getting excited about that time. You see, up until about that time, all he had heard about was Jesus. He had never experienced who Jesus was. He had never experienced the presence of God. He had never experienced the miraculous. And all of a sudden, his friends brought him to Jesus. His friends transferred him over to Jesus. Jesus didn't leave him where he was. Jesus decided, you're one of my child children. You're one of my sons. I'm going to take you personally outside of this place, outside of this world. And I will redeem you and heal you and do some things in your life that you'll never, ever see before. And I wonder how many of us today can see better than when he found us. That's a powerful thing. He never just left me there. He took me with him. You see, my perception is pretty dull. I don't understand the things of eternity But you see, the word of God tells me how important that those things are. You see, people don't understand in our world today why we want to be holy people. But the Bible says they that seek after righteousness, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of God. It's a completely different perception than what they know. They don't understand that we're actually giving ourselves wholly unto the only one who can get us to a place that we can leave this world behind and give us an opportunity to walk with him into his world. That's an awesome thing. Jesus gets out there. He's better. Wouldn't you say he's better? Amen? Is it Sleepy Sunday? It rained today. Do you all feel a little sleepy today? Are you with me? 
Can somebody shout hallelujah? Amen. Amen. Let me know I'm not doing that bad of a job. So he comes, he comes out there. And Jesus has him. Jesus has been ministering to this man. He's getting better. And I'll tell you what happens. When you start to see. When people begin to get around you. And they see what God is doing in your life. It begins to spread. You see, just before this, Jesus is ministering to his disciples. His disciples in Mark chapter 8, in the very beginning, they have just fed 4,000 people. And after the feeding of the 4,000, they have to, Jesus comes in, in direct contact with the Pharisees. Now, Jesus has fed the 4,000 folks, okay? It'd be pretty awesome to see that, wouldn't it? Just to see that. We have a basket up here, we have a church, and we tell 4,000 people to come, and the delivery truck doesn't show up. And people call me and say, Pastor, can you pray over the food? And I say, no, get somebody else, because if this doesn't work, I don't want my name attached to it. So we get over here and we pray over the food. And we have a big lineup outside. Now, get me, get me here. Help, help me out. And everybody decides that they're going to come through that door and they're going to get to the basket of food and they're going to start taking food out. And everybody who reaches their hand in that basket, they get fed. They're going to know, you want to go get fed? Where do you come? Go to New Life Pentecostal Church. Because they're doing something crazy over there. They're feeding all sorts of people, amen? All right. They just went through that miracle. They had two boat rides, and just after their second boat ride, they're hungry, and they forgot a loaf of bread. And you know what they do? They start murmuring and complaining. What are we going to do? How are we going to eat today? Oh, my goodness. Who are you hanging out with, you boys? Who you, who you been following for the last three years? You know what's so ridiculous? We are so able to abstractly replace ourselves from their particular situation, but yet we do the same thing on a daily basis. We look at them like they're the three students, <laughs> but you know what? We might find ourselves a part of the whole process as well. And they're arguing. They just had this happen. And they're arguing over lunch. Who's going to buy it today? We're all broke. Ever been there? Jesus comes to them. And you know what he says? Why is your heart so hard? Why is it so hard with unbelief? You know what happens to us sometimes? When we don't get what we want the way that we think we should get it and the way that we think God should give it to us, we, it hurts our faith. And here is this blind guy that Jesus is taking by the hand and he's allowing his disciples to watch this. As this blind man has to rely on no physical form of understanding. He has to walk without any clear information about what is coming next. He has to actually move in sync with Jesus Christ. And as soon as he gets there, Jesus relinquishes control and begins to ask him some things. Are you seeing yet? I love that part. I'm not seeing yet, but I'm seeing better than I used to see. I'm not seeing everything the way that I want to see the beginning from the end. 
But I am seeing things that I never understood, that I never fully comprehended. I'm seeing things about the kingdom of God that are given to me, that give me power here on earth with God. That if I can walk in those things, it gives me authority. It brings him into the midst of right where I'm at. And if I will act dependent and submissive and humble myself, I can grab the hand of God. That's what I get when I don't do it my way. That's what I get when I do it his way. When I do it his way, I get everything that he's got to give in this situation. So here he is, and they're watching this. And he says to the blind guy a second time, he says to him, can you see? And he says, I can see. Here's the issue. This guy can see now, right? We can agree on that. He's, he can see. Jesus healed him. Jesus tells him to go back to his house. But don't go back to where? The village. Don't go back to Bethesda. Who's with him? Got to remember, his disciples have been with Jesus. They get a completely different set of orders. He tells them, go into all the world. You see, that blind man couldn't go past the boundaries that were set for him. Because Jesus said, that city will not hear the word of God. So what do you do when you have a boundary in place? What do you do when God puts an obstacle in your way? He didn't even tell the blind man, go back, get your friends. In fact, if his friends were from that city, what could possibly happen to his Friends, what do you do when you have an obstacle and God actually decides that he's not going to allow you to go to a particular place? It's tough, isn't it? Have you ever had a friend that you love that when God was doing a great work in your life, you were sure that you could get them to come to church with you? And you just loved that person and they, were, they meant the world to you. And you were going to be the one. You were going to get them in church. And it seemed like everything you did, they would get as far away from you as they could possibly go. And that's a tough thing. It, it, it bothers, it blows our mind when there's issues and things in our life that we can't get control of. And Jesus didn't give us that particular assignment. To be the one that would be their Savior. But he did give us another assignment. That means we have to learn his kingdom. We have to learn where he has given us the authority. Let's all get ready to stand. We're getting ready to close. And Sister Valley, if you can help me. Amen. This is the part that gets exciting for me. You see... Sometimes it's so frustrating when we come to church and we have good church and we have good revival. And we learn some things in here that stir us, they move us. And we start getting filled with a heart of compassion and we start feeling that God, you're going to use my life to do some incredible things and when you go as you're you're a young man and there's some young people here and we can see them and they're singing and I pray that we get behind them every opportunity that I get you see them you see them getting up here to sing I want them to feel like they're the biggest rock star that ever walked across a platform because they're lifting up the presence of almighty God and I pray that if we can treat them here like we want them here and they matter here, then they may want to stay here and when raise their families here and do all the things that they need to do here. Amen? So they're doing that. 
And you see, God didn't call you to go over here. He didn't call you to do this. He didn't call you to do that. He didn't call you to maybe preach the gospel in Africa. He didn't call you and you've been wondering, God, how come I can't? Because you've got to get in His perspective. You see, uh, His perspective can start boiling down into something real simple. God wants us to be faithful. Oh, wow. Woo! See, you don't, you, don't, you don't understand that because the little things with God make a tremendous impact. You see that little journey that that blind man took outside the city? There was so much done from the time that his friends gave him to Jesus. He had to get used to the voice of God. When you miss enough church, when you miss things that's happening, you miss your sensitivity, you miss your perception, and a whole new reality, you go back to what's familiar. And the thing about it is, nothing about God is familiar to us. You need a whole brand new perception. Faithfulness is so, so important. The other thing that's important is simple obedience. Oh man, that's a lot. I'll tell you where simple obedience comes in. It means that I'm looking to glorify God, not just on Sunday, but on Monday and on Tuesday. Let me tell you what that looks like, because it's going to help your perception. It means that I'm going to Watch my tongue so that nothing that comes out of my mouth will offend God. It means that whether everyone else is late at work, I am not going to be late at work. I'm going to glorify God with my time, with my talents, with everything that's a part of me. Now, you, you'll see where I'm going with all this. Because you've got to understand how God is moving in this last day. You see, what he's actually looking for is not someone to do his job. He's God and God all alone, all by himself. He is God. What he's actually doing is he's actually looking for a vessel that says, God, this body here, this mind that's here, it's not up to me to understand what comes next. Just use it for your glory. And I'm going to leave all the changing to you. I'm going to leave all the convincing to you. I'm going to leave all the miraculous to you. I'm going to leave everything else to you. If they never come to church one time, that's not my thing. That's your thing. But God, if you want to use anything, use, use me. You see, to get to that place, you can't be looking at what everyone else is looking at. Success in this world is not the same success in his world. And until we learn how to look through his eyes, we won't see the miraculous that we want to see until we start holding on to Jesus like it's everything that's within us. We're getting ready to close. We're going to have an altar call here shortly. When Jesus gets out of the boat, I'm going to tell you, when you get out of the boat, it's scary. It's freaky. When you get out of the boat, you kind of start getting out from what's familiar. We love familiar. We love the four songs before worship. We love pastors going to preach at this time. We love it when we know what's going to happen. We know we love it when we know when church is going to end. But what happens when it just gets unfamiliar and all of a sudden 
We're not ending when we used to end and the spirit is moving. How are you going to act right then? How are you going to get prepared for what God really has? Amen? We got to get to be people who desire more than what we're experiencing right now and right here. Jesus took this man completely out of his comfort zone. And for some of us, he's going to need to do the exact same thing. He needs to shake some of us up when the winds and the waves start moving all about. And he gets out of the boat and he's looking, who's going to get out of the boat with me? The boat! Oh, the boat is so good to be in the boat. I don't want to get out of the boat. But you know what? For what God's calling us to do, we're going to have to step out, on the bo- out of the boat. You're going to have to be obedient to God whether or not it's comfortable. You're going to have to be faithful to God whether or not you understand and you need to be sensitive to God whether or not it makes sense to you, whether or not you understand everything that's going to be happening on the next day or the day after that. You have to be faithful to Almighty God. If you want to see God do the miraculous in your life, you have to be faithful to Him and to Him alone. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'll tell you something. There's been some things happening in our church. There's been some people. They're seeing things they've never seen before. They are, God is moving them in a different direction. And I've been noticing now that they have a stronger desire. It's not just, I want to pray. It's God. I want to pray more. I want to, I want to do this. They're, they're not missing services. They're, they're being faithful. Their families here. They're, they're entrenching, indoctrinating them with the word of God. They're getting them ready for what God is getting ready to do. And they have a desire for the things of God. And one of the things I pray that we get in our hearts, that this world is temporary. This world will pass away. The car, the job, the hustle, the bustle, the clothes, the prestige, the esteem. It's going to go. But what we do for God is going to last. It will endure to the end. Hallelujah. I don't want to take up any more time. But I do want us to come to an altar and get prepared right now for what God is getting ready to do in this church, in this city, and in this world. I pray, God, that you'd have your way in a miraculous way. Get our perspective, God, in the line with you. Jesus, help us to get our perspective, oh God, in line with what you're doing. Help us, God, to get on move with you. Help us to understand what you're doing. We may not understand, God, where we're at right now, but you're doing something, God, with us, Lord.